Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance as all glories to your Prabhupada. Welcome devotees to our morning Bhagavatam class. This morning we will be hearing from Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila, chapter 2, verse 20, and the chapter is entitled Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and the class will be given by His Holiness, Chandramali Swami, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you and all glories to your Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, my obeisance is to Anasuya, Hare Krishna, and to the devotees. Hare Krishna, good to be back. I feel like I'm back home when I come back to your broadcast. <laughs> Maharaj, we are always looking forward to your classes and your darshan and your blessings and your mercy and everything else that comes with it. <laughs> um, there's a few extra things you added there, but anyway. <laughs> I'm trying to be greedy here, Maharaj. <laughs> There's no mercy. <laughs> Even demons have mercy, can give mercy too. <laughs> Oh boy, you put me back into the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, Maharaj. We can add that to this if you want. Uh, well, no, the next verse is the Bhagavatam, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> so we'll continue and we'll go through. Because this verse is just, I'll speak, I'll speak on each of the verses. That's fine, Maharaj. Okay. Uh, and we'll start. Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Vakarinda Atava Bahuna Tena Kimjitena to Arjuna Vistabhyam Idam Krishnam Ikam Sena Stito Jagat. The personality of God and Sri Krishna says, What more shall I say to you? I live throughout this cosmic manifestation merely by a single plenary portion. Krishna is speaking to Arjuna. So last verse practically in the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita describing his own potencies to Arjuna. Krishna spoke the verse. Umagyanti maranda siyagyana dhyana salataya chaksu nimitam yena tasma shri guru yena maha shri chaitanya manobhistam stakitam yena bhutale swayam nupakadam mayam vidati svampadakitam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamani Namaste Saraswati Deva Gauravani Vacharine Nirvasesa Sunyavari Vasyatya Deva Satarine Panchakalpa Tui Vishya Kripa Sindhu Kaye Vichya Patitanam Bhagavad Gyo Vaishnavi Vyana Mahar Maha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gita Hare Siva Sri Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So uh, in the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita starting with verse around verses 20 21 Krishna goes on for about 20 some verses describing the powerful elements within the material energy and describing that he is the personification of each one of them. In other words, he's the best in all categories. So one who describes or can describe something that is outstanding within the category, one should see Krishna in that. Of course, one should learn to see Krishna in everything. But these more outstanding and more prominent aspects of the material energy and material personalities also are reflective of the greatness of God because their greatness is simply the energy of God. 
And here Krishna, after speaking in such detail with so many varieties, he sums it up at the end. Uh, what more can I say? Uh, that actually what I'm describing to you is just a tiny fraction of my, my opulences. It's so small, it's insignificant. Although to some people it seems so grand and that mostly for those who have a very less understanding of the nature of the personality of Godhead, when they hear about him and his categories of greatness within the material world, then they become overwhelmed with awe and reverence toward the Lord. But these are, as Krishna says, they're so insignificant. <laughs> I mean, Krishna's opulences and his unlimited power and existence comprises everything. And we can go into the spiritual world and the manifestations on how the, the, the uh, material world unfolds in so many different ways. All of these are just a part of Krishna's unlimited power. Uh, no one can understand or even begin to describe the glories of the Lord. And we have um, Ananta Sesh, who is the multi-headed serpent, who sits on the bottom of all the universes and holds the universes on his hoods. He is so huge that the universes appear to be just like mustard seeds on the top of his head. They're so insignificantly small compared to him. He chants the glories of the Lord from time immemorial, and it's explained that he never repeats the same one. So he, he is an, an expansion of Sri Balaram in his manifestation as Ananta Shesh. <laughs> so we get a little indication from other aspects of the Lord's greatness, how unlimitedly powerful Krishna is can't be described. And so it helps us to understand that everything, especially in this reflective statement here that Krishna's summing up after he describes himself in different categories, that uh, um, we can start to see him in the material energy. We see something wonderful. I remember I was... Uh, we went to, uh, I was in Canada many years ago at the Rathiyatra there. And then uh, we decided to go to Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is a, you know, considered one of the wonders of the world. And it's on two sides. It's on the U.S. side and it's on the Canadian side. On the Canadian side, it's much more grander. And these are huge waterfalls that are just pouring billions of gallons of water continuously coming from, we don't know the sources. <laughs> um, the sources cannot be seen. They're just pouring out of these uh, the sides of these mountains. And it's going on and the water is so voluminous and so powerfully rushing that it's an awe-inspiring experience. So I remember when we were there one day and we were watching and there were some, some tourists next to us and there was a lady with a little boy. And uh, the little boy said to his mother, um, well, who created this? <laughs> and the lady said, well, that, that's nature. And then I was with one devotee, so I told him, tell the lady it was God. <laughs> so he immediately turned around and said to the lady, God created it. And then she corrected herself. She said to her son, oh, yes, God created it. So, yeah, um, we, get a, we can see that these powerful exhibitions of material energy as Krishna says, they're only a tiny, insignificant portion of his all unlimited powers. But this is the way that people get some experience 
of God for a devotee, they're not so much overwhelmed by these things. They know that the real opulences of God is his mercy upon the conditioned souls in the material world. When he shows his mercy in different ways, these are his opulences. For instance, when he wants something done, he doesn't do it himself, although he is qualified to do it himself. He will inspire one of his devotees to do it for him. As Prabhupada uses the example that he could have spread Krishna consciousness all over the world when he was here as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he made India, practically the whole country, was fully Krishna conscious. And then the question came, why didn't he take it around the world? And Prabhupada said, well, he left it for me to do. And what Prabhupada was saying is that the Lord likes to empower his devotees to do wonderful things on his behalf. And this is one of his opulences. His opulence is along with the empowerment is, is his mercy upon his devotee because although he, he does everything and he supplies the ingredients for everything to get done, he never wants to become the person to take the credit. He likes his devotees to take the credit. And Prabhupada said, sometimes he appears in a dream and his garden is, is, is not in good, good shape. So he tells his devotee, make my garden. And the devotee gets inspired to the dream. And then the Lord helps him carry out the activity and the, the devotee gets the credit. Or the devotee will build a temple for the Lord and inspired by the Lord within the heart. So this is, this is closer to his grand opulence as, as he is so powerful he doesn't want it and so great that everything should be is attributed to him, but he is at the same time very renounced that he doesn't want to take the credit. He likes to give the credit to his devotee. So, but when a devotee does something on behalf of the Lord and it comes out successful, then the devotee wants to give credit to the Lord, but the Lord at the same time glorifies the devotees and says, oh, you've done a nice job. And everyone else gives credit to the devotee. So that's Krishna. That's one of his opulences is that he is so powerful, yet so renounced at the same time. Um, okay. So uh, these are some of the principles that we can think about. Um, the, the grandeur Power, opulence, magnitude of Krishna's existence is beyond description. Um, here, he gives a little indication of to the material energy. But uh, Prabhupada would say that the, the entire material creation consists of one fourth of the portion of everything in existence. And that means the collective planets throughout the material energy, which includes the 14 planetary systems, which have unlimited planets in these planetary systems. You have Swarga Loka, you have Bhu Loka, and you have Bhuva Loka, the three levels of existence, 14 planetary systems, and unlimited planets in those. It says the Koti, millions of different planets, universes. And this is only one fourth. And Prabhupada would say this universe that we are in is the one is one is one of the smallest of all the universes. Many of the universes are much bigger, have more uh, planets, and are characterized by a Lord Brahma who takes charge of each other of the universe according to the size of the universe, the Brahma has so many heads. So he, in this universe, he only has four heads. In other universes, he has eight heads, 10 heads, 20, a million heads. 
so many heads because of the size of the universe was indicated by the size of Lord Brahma. So these are just, and then that's only one fourth of, fourth of the creation. One fourth of the existence, which is the creation, the manifestation, which has no creation, is the three fourths aspect of the spiritual world. That three fourths aspect includes various manifestations of universes with spiritual planets, and on each one of the planets, the Lord expands himself into a form of himself to manage on that particular planet or to be worshipped on that particular planet. So that is the Vaikuntha realm, which is unlimited. It's actually, it's actually expanded from Lord Balara himself. And it has uh, many, 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 we can't even begin to describe how big it is. Just one planet alone is bigger than the universe that we sit on. So this is uh, the, the magnitude of the Lord. But then again, there's another feature of the Lord that is so amazing that he can be smaller than the small. And he enters into the hearts of all living entities as super soul. And he sits within that heart, guiding each and every living entity accordingly. He's called Antaryami, or the, the, in, the, the internal manifestation of the guide of the living entity. The external manifestation is the spiritual master, which is an expansion of the super soul himself. <laughs> so in his super soul feature, he is everywhere. <laughs> He's in the hearts of all living entities, no matter what living entity it is, even if it's a worm in stool, he's in the heart of that living entity. Of course, because he is spiritual and transcendental, although he sits in the heart of that person, he doesn't touch the material energy at all. He is so kind that he accompanies each and one of the living entities in their struggle in material existence, guiding them in different ways. and. He, as it says, everywhere of his arms and legs, eyes and faces, and this way the super soul exists. So he, there's another feature of Krishna in his super soul feature, aside from his Bhagavad feature, in his unlimited forms, in the personal, personal aspect of the Lord. And then in the Brahman feature, he is the, the spiritual rays that pervade the entire universes. Uh, just like the sun has sunshine, there's one sun in every universe, and that sun can light up the universe. It's so powerful. And it's amazing because if you actually analyze the sun, the sun has been existing for billions and billions of millenniums, but that same sun doesn't diminish in its power. So where does that energy come from? Unlimited light, unlimited heat, and there's no you know, generator there to supply power from another source. It comes from Krishna. And Krishna says, the sun is simply my eye and the moon is my other eye. So through the moon and the sun, he reflects heat and light and happiness and also cooling rays and gives nourishment to the vegetables. In other words, in all aspects of existence, Krishna is there in different, as in different parts, giving the energy, the power, the facility, everything is there. One time in one lecture, Prabhupada wanted to emphasize the oneness of the absolute truth. So he said, we are Krishna, you are Krishna, we all are Krishna, everything is Krishna, it's only Krishna. <laughs> of course, when he spoke like that, everyone thought, my God, what is Prabhupada saying? Now he's saying, he used to say, well, anyone who said he's God, he's dog, and now he's saying something else. No, what he was trying to, and then he clarified what he wanted to express that, yes, you know, Krishna cannot be separated from anything because everything is 
coming from him. We're sitting on a particular chair. That chair was, is made out of water metal. And water metal was coming from the material energy in the form of a tree or various metals found within the earth. And all of these metals in the tree, the wood of the tree is supplied by the Lord through his various energies. And being one of the elements of material energy earth, it forms, it comes in the form of wood. And Krishna says, I create the basic elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. They're created by the Lord and they are formulated by Lord Brahma, guided by Krishna in the heart. Brahma gets the intelligence how to take the entire creation and formulate it. But Krishna gives the direction and Brahma does the work. And the ingredients are supplied by the Lord. So the point we're trying to make is that you can't get away from God. <laughs> He's everywhere. <laughs> and, but the devotees really love to worship the God in his in God in his form as the um, Archivigraha deity in the temple, who manifests his uh, sweetness to the for the Lord for the devotees to worship. And out of all of the opulences of the Lord, the deity reflects his beauty opulence as the most prominent. And therefore the devotees get attracted to the beauty of the Lord and develop an attraction for the Lord and ultimately worship the Lord. So this, this feature of beauty as described throughout the scriptures, Krishna's beauty is being described in so many different ways, is the sinusor or the focus of the devotee in their in their worship of Krishna. Krishna is so beautiful. I remember I was in one temple, it was in America, and uh, one devotee, he was running the temple, him and his wife, it was a small little family temple, and they received a gift of clothes that were stitched for their deities. They had deities of Jagannath, Subhadra, and Balaram and Gornitai, and also Nisringadev. So he received this gift of clothes. So he's looking at the clothes and he's thinking, hmm, these clothes are not so nice. <laughs> uh, but then he thought, oh, it's a gift, I should try it on. So when he put them on the Lord, and uh, they addressed the Lord that day, he was astonished to see how beautiful the Lord looked in the clothes. So it wasn't so much the clothes, it was the Lord that made the clothes beautiful. <laughs> as soon as the clothes came upon the Lord, the clothes took on a whole different appearance, a whole different uh, uh, expression. So that, that was, that's another indication that anything connected with Krishna uh, becomes nice. I'll use another example, maybe it's not so nice. We see devotees, they come to Krishna consciousness and they're quite, a, sometimes they're raggy or kind of not so looking, nice looking. You know, they are, you know, maybe, you know, they kind of go into the category of being unattractive. <laughs> but as soon as they start engaging in devotional service and connect with Krishna, and then all of a sudden they become attractive. <laughs> when they first join, they look quite haggard or ragged out, or just who they are. But after in devotional service, they become beautiful. <laughs> so that <laughs> that is Krishna. As soon as anything connects it with Krishna, takes on some of his qualities like that. So, therefore, uh, this verse is just a small indication of the real opulence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which is unlimited and indescribable, we can't imagine. Therefore, what does this pretty much say is that there's no other place to put your attention. There, I just read something this morning that 
you may see beauty in another person, but if you want to find all the beauty in one place, go to Krishna. <laughs> Krishna is, we, sometimes we use the terminology, Krishna is beautiful, but that is not really descriptive of Krishna. We don't say Krishna is beautiful, we say Krishna is beauty. Beauty gets its definition from Krishna. So that's one of the power gets its definition from Krishna. When uh, Prahlad Maharaj was being harassed by his father and he was able to withstand his harassment in so many ways, his father was uh, amazed and astonished to see how powerful his son was. He tried everything to kill him, he couldn't do it. He was a five-year-old boy and he wasn't even fighting back. So Harani Kasibu said, you know, where do you get your power from? <laughs> and uh, Prahlad mentioned, well, I get my power from any, where everybody gets the power from, where you get your power from, from the same purse, from Vishnu. <laughs> of course, Harani Kasibu didn't like that answer. But that was factual, that even the demons get their power from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. There's only one source of all greatness and all existence, and that is Krishna himself. Um, so when you actually understand, in, understand completely, there is nothing outside of the Lord. And the Lord is divided into two aspects of himself, the Lord and his energy. So therefore we say achintya, veda, veda, tattva, that the, everything is one with and different from the Lord. The different from is the energy and the one with is his personal feature. But as Prabhupada made that indication, even the energy is non-different than the Lord because it is coming from the Lord. But we worship the energy of the Lord by giving the energy of the Lord to Krishna in devotion. And that is, the, that is bhakti yoga, to take the energy of the Lord. Whatever you have, your possessions, your intelligence, your time, your uh, resources, whatever you have, uh, you use them in the service of the Lord. And then they become what we say, again, connected to their source. So that's why we say everything in devotional service is of the nature of spirit, because as soon as it connects back with the spirit, it again attains its natural position. So from the absolute point of view, there's no such thing as matter or material. Material means, simply means cut off from. We use that terminology in order to talk about the creative energy, such as this energy. It's called Vaihiranga Shakti. There is Antaranga Shakti, Vaihiranga Shakti, and Tatasta Shakti. So the Lord's uh, energies are divided into different categories, which function in different ways. But they're all spiritual because they're all coming from the same source. Although they manifest themselves differently, therefore we describe them as being material, spiritual, or a combination of both. But they're all spiritual because nothing material can come from Krishna. But what makes it a material is that when the living entities in the material world use the energy of the Lord to, for their own selfish interests, then it's material. And then when he connected back, to Krishna in devotion, it again attains its spiritual nature. And even the scientists were able to come up with something. They said matter cannot be created or destroyed. And that's fine, that's actually true. Matter cannot be created or destroyed because in, in, in its essence, it's spiritual. You can break matter down to its essence. For instance, if you take water and put it on a fire and boil it, it'll evaporate and turn into gas, which is another form of the material energy. So it evaporates, but all you're doing is changing the molecular structure of the material and changing it to another form of itself. But it's, it still exists only in another form, that's all. 
just like our body is made of a combination of earth, water, fire, and air. So combined, it looks like something, <laughs> but actually all it is, if you break it down, is these four elements. That's all it is, but it turns into a form of a body. And then if you look at it, you take it apart, you find that there's only these four elements, that's all, in different combinations to make up blood and bones and various types of secretions in the body. That's all. that's all it is. It's Krishna's energy formulated in a certain way. That's all. So uh, the point is that once we know this, that's why Krishna spoke this particular chapter to Arjun to let you know that there's nothing outside of him. And ultimately, if you want to see him, Here's one way to find him in the greatness of the material existence. But that's generally for those who don't have much knowledge. That's why Krishna said, yeah, <laughs> it's only a small portion of who I am. My real, the real opulence of the Lord, again, is his compassion upon the fallen souls. But the real attraction for the Lord is not the power of the material energy, but the Lord himself in his transcendental feature as he manifests his different incarnations. So all of these incarnations, when we read about their pastimes, we develop an uh, interest in Krishna and that interest turns into a type of attraction, which comes, then we get attached to Krishna and we want to hear more about Krishna. And then we develop our love for Krishna. So everything is connected to him, but the essence for the devotees is to hear and chant his glories, which are illustrated by his pure devotees. When they write books or when they speak, then we understand, yes, here is Krishna. Yes, he is all attractive. <laughs> that is Krishna. And for those who manifest the worship of Krishna who become absorbed in worshiping his deity form, for them they become absorbed in Krishna and uh, dressing the deity, bathing the deity, waking up the deity, feeding the deity, putting the deity to rest, uh, singing songs to the deity. This, this becomes their absorption and that way they become fully Krishna conscious. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a little, this is just, I just, I didn't even scratch the surface. And there's even no, I didn't even make any mark about the opulences of Krishna. It's not possible. <laughs> you know, it, it, there's one verse in the Bhagavatam, it says that uh, as birds, according to their wing power, can fly up into the sky so high, similarly, when one tries to glorify the Lord, according to his own ability, he can just go so high. <laughs> but this, then it goes on to say, the sky is unlimited, but the birds are limited. So in the same way, Krishna is unlimited. So whatever we say about him is totally minuscule compared to his you know, opulence. Mm -hmm. But there's enough there for each and every devotee to become fully Krishna conscious. And that's the main point, is that although we may not know so much about God, still, if we become fully attracted to God in devotion, then we can become fully purified and go back home, back to Godhead and attain the goal of life. So therefore, there's, every, there's something for everyone, and everyone can reach perfection, even though we only know a small portion of the, the total existence of the Lord. That portion is not even uh, describable, it's so small. <laughs> okay, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for such a wonderful class. And when you said that you didn't even scratch it. I was like, wow, this is going to be 
an amazing, amazing class. But thank you so much for um, really helping us to see if we can with our conditioned eyes, at least for me, Krishna's opulence all around us. would like to ask devotees if any questions, any comments, any clarification on the what, what we just heard or anything related, any questions that you have on your mind, please uh, do raise your hand or you can just jump right in. And I'm going to go down this list here to see if there's any questions. Marge, I have, oh, okay. I have yes. a question, Marge, and it's, and um, Come back to the, uh, come back to the actual, yeah. You know, okay, screaming. shall I share screen? I mean, just stop sharing, March. Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah, come back to that. That's sure. nice. And ask the devotees if they can turn on their uh, cameras. That's nice. Please, devotees, can you please turn on your camera? Marge is humbly requesting all of us to have as much as we can personal association through this machine. <laughs> <laughs> This is another feature of Krishna's energy. <laughs> yes, Marge. Um, Marge, I would like to ask a question. You know, as you were speaking about uh, seeing Krishna everywhere, Krishna's opulence and um, uh, Krishna's energy, and at the same time, we see what is happening in Kali Yuga, and with so much destruction so much, uh, you know, uh, war and disagreements and, you know, people wanting to take over control. And I, and I was asked this question, how can one see Krishna's energy or opulence through all this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, uh, he says, Mitya Sarva Arashya Hum, he says in the Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, I'm also deaf. <laughs> And he also says that, um, what else, he, he says that, yeah, he is, uh, he is, he expands himself as Brahma, as the creator. He expands himself as Vishnu, as the maintainer, and he expands himself as Shiva, as the destroyer. So Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are the energies of the Lord, Vishnu being his personal form. Well, Brahma and Shiva are creating and destroying. Muta, Bhutnuya, Baliyate. So uh, the living entity misuses their independence to try to become independent of the Lord, to enjoy separately. And then there is conflict on all levels. When, each, when so many individuals want to become uh, separate from the Lord and enjoy the Lord's uh, resources, property, then there's competition. And that competition brings envy, anger, greed, and lust. And so, of course, there's different levels of consciousness. The pious people accept what they can get and be happy with it and live nicely. The persons in the mode of ignorance, they're never satisfied with whatever they had. They want more and more. And they want to become greedy to uh, observe other person's properties. One nation gets envious of another nation and wants to destroy that nation. So there's conflict. And that conflict is an expression of anger. And as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, um, it's the all devouring sinful enemy of this world is anger because it destroys everything. And so they've made weapons of destructions out of the resources of the material energy, uh, taking nuclear power and using it in the form of uh, armaments in order to destroy each other. So um, this is the misuse of the independence of the living entity, which the Lord allows to happen because he gives independence, but he also gives intelligence and direction and how to use that independence to go back to him and back, come back to the spiritual world. But there are a class of people that reject the Lord, don't believe in the Lord, and want to remain independent of the Lord. And therefore, the material world facilitates that type of persons. 
So the material world is a place of conflict. It's a place of suffering. It's a place of um, uncertainty. And it comes in different forms. And so this is the nature of this world. And so for a devotee, devotee doesn't want to be part of this world. They want to be part of the spiritual world. So the devotee uses the resources for, that the Lord gives to serve the Lord. And the non-devotees use the resources in order to enjoy, try to enjoy separately. Of course, that enjoyment is not real. It's another form of struggle, that's all. And so because people cannot become happy with material resources, but they have this illusion that they can. So they think if I just get more, I'll be happy. I just don't have enough for happiness. I need more. And so when, when that consciousness becomes pervading, then, then there's conflict on different levels. You have the example of uh, Harani Aksha. He was never satisfied. He just simply take, took as much gold out of the, out of the earth and caused the earth to fall out of its orbit into the Garbhadak Ocean. Nowadays, they're drilling into the earth for precious metals, for natural gas, for oil. It's disturbing the balance of the earth. So this greed, greed, greed is an expansion of lust. When lust becomes so strong, it turns into greed, and then greed just is, destroys all the good qualities of the living entity and causes people to be envious towards one another. So these bad qualities are reflective reflections of rejecting God and trying to become separate and enjoy separate from God. That's all. This is the material world. It's a prison house. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. I like how you ended that the prison house is like here. <laughs> a prison house with invisible walls, Marge. Is it possible to, to, to yeah. assume that? Yeah, the walls are invisible. The chains are invisible. <laughs> but they're there. That's why this world, this material world is called Maitunya Agura the shackles of sex life. So sex life is the number one chain that keeps everyone bound up in this material existence. Papa said, if that wasn't there, people wouldn't do anything. <laughs> it represents the highest form of pleasure in the material world. But we have seen that even those who have as much as they want and can get as more, they're still never satisfied. And so what they go after is something even more subtle than gross sex life, and that is the power of control. So that the power of control is even a greater form of, of uh, what's the word? Greater form of desire for those of demoniac mentality. They want to control more and more and more so they can enjoy more and more and more. Just the idea of controlling is, a, is an opulence of enjoyment. In other words, they, they find great pleasure the more they can control. That's a demoniac mentality. And I'll give you some statistics. 87% of all of the natural resources in the world today are, are owned and controlled by three corporations in the world, 87%. I can name two of the corporations, but I won't name them. <laughs> I was about to ask you much what they were, but I'll... If you want, I'll name them, but uh, you write me an email and I'll send you the names. <laughs> yes, Marge, I'll send you an email, Marge. <laughs> These are statistics. So, you know, the governments are controlled by the demons also. No government is independent in the world. They're all controlled by big, powerful demons who have no allegiance to any country. Their allegiance is to a one world, powerful, control type government, which they want to orchestrate 
and through their energies. And that's the demons. All you have to do is read the Bhagavatam. You'll see how the demons think. <laughs> or you just simply listen to the words of Krishna. He explains what the demons think. So I think I mentioned in one particular lecture, I'm not sure if it was here. It's a statement by Prabhupada where he said, um, Maya, we have no, uh, we have no problem with Maya. But because there are demons, Maya has to serve the demons, and therefore there's so many problems in the world because of the demons. <laughs> so Maya is subservient to the demons now. Um, because they worship him, her. Just like we worship Krishna's different forms, they also worship some of the horrible forms of material energy, which are personified in some of the uh, demigods, like Kali Bhairavya, which is an expansion of Lord Shiva, or Bhadra Kali, which is an expansion of Durga, Chandidas, and these are all manifestations of the external energy that are worshipped by the demons in order to get more and more power. You see in the Bhagavatam, when the, uh, these Dakoids captured Jad Bharat, they uh, wanted to make a, a sacrifice of him in front of the goddess Ch Chandi, goddess Durga, I think it was. And so they were going to make a human sacrifice in front of him. But because he was a pure devotee of the Lord, Chandi didn't allow it. So she came, she sent her, uh, her female assistants and they came out of the deity of Chandi and started killing the Dakwites. <laughs> yeah, it's in the, it's in the, you can read it in the fifth canto. It's actually visualized in the form of some artwork there. So yeah, the demons also worship these uh, lower forms of the demigods. We brought, well, you know, uh, Ravana worshipped Shiva. <laughs> uh, Rani Kashipu worshipped Lord Brahma. Kamsa, he was worshipping Durga also. <laughs> So the little demons, they don't know anything about worship. They just make policy. <laughs> Let's start a war over here. Like this war that's going on now in, in, in Ukraine. It's just, uh, it's another step in, in bringing control into the world. That's all it is. It's another part of the demons plan to, uh, it's 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 i can't really get into details because it's too complicated because there's so many factors to it and it, because it's politics you can never be certain about politics because politics is never <laughs> never absolute and there's so many dynamics to it but ultimately it's another plan of the demons for control that's what it is ultimately Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Namata Mataji, please go ahead. So, so you're, yes, wondering why, you're wondering why there's so many problems in the world. <laughs> the demons are there. It's the demons plus all the problems. <laughs> yes, Maharaj, they get way too active and way too busy. Yeah. Therefore, we want to, we want to bring in Lord Chaitanya's movement. And we do that through Harding Nam Sankirtan. This will push back the influence of the demons. And that's Lord Chaitanya's plan for this, for, for this age, is Sri Harinam Sankirtan, to purify the world and bring people back to Krishna consciousness. So Mahaprabhu has a plan. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Yes, Namrata Mataji, please ask your question. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Guru Maharaj, uh, very first thing you told uh, 
it's the prison but i i guess we are in the best shelter because you you already did the prison preaching so we are in the best hands i guess we well, you 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 so, you uh, on parole right now <laughs> uh Pretty so soon you'll be a pretty soon you'll be a free free soul. Right now you're on parole. <laughs> so we we are at least satisfied. We are in the best shelter, Maharaj. We we are directed in a uh, in a right direction under your shelter. So. Prabhupada, Prabhupada is the he's a person that's getting us all out of prison. <laughs> yes, 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 Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, my question was, uh, this question is not exactly from me, but uh, there was a person who was more inclined towards uh, Shiva Bhakti. So he questioned me that, uh, like uh, people in Vrindavan, they uh, worship uh, Radha Rani to get, the, uh, to get the mercy of Krishna. So, uh, being a highest Vaishnava, why can't uh, we worship Shiva to get the same? Well, this Shiva worship is like Krishna only accept worship that is done in devotion, but Shiva will accept different kinds of worship based on austerities, penances, and different rituals. So different types of people worship Shiva. Some worship him as a demigod for material benefits, and some worship him as the Supreme Lord, because in the Shiva Purana and other places, he is also glorified as Bhagavan Shiva. So if they worship Shiva as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then that's fine. Let them worship in that way. That's good. That's all right. Because eventually Shiva will take them to Krishna. But if they worship Shiva for material benedictions, which is another form of worship that he accepts, then, um, then it's, it's, what will happen is they'll just go down. Um, these demigods will facilitate various types of worships, depending on the nature of the worshiper and the ingredients and the use of the worship. So we don't discourage people to worship Shiva who are worshiping him as the Supreme, but we do discourage people to worship him as a, as a demigod. Yeah, Shiva is like that, he's quite diverse. And you see some of the followers of Shiva our ghosts, rakshasas, and people on very low uh, levels of existence. The demons worship Shiva. But then also, we also, godly people worship Shiva too. But the results of the godly people worshiping Shiva is that Shiva is a devotee of Ram. Uh, so if you worship Shiva, you'll come, out, if you worship Shiva properly, You'll come to Krishna worship or Ram worship, either one. Okay. But so you have to see what is what type of worship they're approaching Shiva with. Because if you stop them from worshiping Shiva and they're worshiping Shiva as the supreme, then you destroy their bhakti and then they won't worship anything. But if they're worshiping him as a as a demigod, then um, you know, we should say, well, actually, uh, worship him as the supreme if you want to worship Shiva. But if you can encourage him to worship Krishna, that's even better. Yes, Guru Maharaj. I, that is the ideal worship. Uh, but some people I do see uh, that they are naturally more inclined towards the uh, Shiva Bhakti. So I was just wondering over this, that, you know, many times you try to tell the person so much about Krishna, but, you know, they, they turn around and come back to Shiva Bhakti. And because, because they have that natural inclination, or maybe from years they are practicing that. So as long as they're not worshiping for material benefits, then that's fine. 
Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you okay. for the clarification. That was really an interesting answer. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Namrata. Mother Gita, please go ahead, Mother. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, our grace to Shri Prabhupada, our grace to you. Thank you so much for such a nice class, Maharaj. You were talking about being on parole and coming out. So uh, can you please uh, explain what are the symptoms of one who is on parole and what should one do to come out of this prison house? Thank you, Maharaj. Well, on parole means you're 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 on your way out or you're out, but you still have to take, you have to be accountable so you don't again fall back into your prison-like activities. So in other words, we may not be fully Krishna conscious, but we're executing devotional service. So that's the parole category. When we become fully Krishna conscious, then we are free. In other words, those who still have material desires but are ac ac executing devotional service, they're moving away from the prison, but still they could also go back to the prison if they are not accountable to their spiritual master, to devotional service, to the instructions given. In other words, they're mixed devotees. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Thank you, Gita. Hare Krishna, my obeisances. Thanks, Amai. Any other questions from devotees on this really nice discussion? Marge, what was coming to my mind by when a question that was coming to my mind when you were answering Mother Gita's question is you uh, you mentioned the word accountable. How can one be accountable when one is not aware? And I have actually come across some situations like that. Well, I have to make people aware. <laughs> That's the idea. That's what preaching is about. It's mm. helping people become aware that they have to be accountable. To Krishna, to the spiritual master, to the, the process of devotional service. We always have accountability on some level. Even in the material world, people have to be accountable to their family members in some form, to their responsibilities in the, in the social environment. So everyone's accountable, but devotees have to be accountable to Krishna through the, the spiritual master. That's the main category or main avenue for accountability is we very carefully follow the instructions of the spiritual master. Mind you, I think one, uh, one key word that you used that really was like pretty strong for me was accountable to Krishna and, and, and the spiritual master. That was a very strong point. Yeah, otherwise we'll be accountable to something material. You can't get away from this accountability. It's part of our existence. Because as soon as we perform activities, we're connecting with some category of existence. And then there's an accountability to that category. So when we, when we connect with devotional service, we're, we're meant to be accountable to the spiritual master. And to, if we're working under the guise of some authority, then we're accountable to that temple president, that yatra leaders, Thank you, Marge. Any other questions from devotees? Any thoughts, clarification? Yes, Mother Sukhavaha, please go ahead. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. <clears throat> please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shila Prabhupada and all glories to your lotus feet. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for the wonderful and very deep class. Um, 
I've got a silly question. Um, uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, sometimes we get devotional service uh, from so many devotees. And it's very difficult to cope up with all of them. How do we, like, prioritize or what shall we do in that case? <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, the tendency is to do what we like to do. They say that you shouldn't be doing the devotional service you like to do. You should do what are, you are told to do, isn't it? So I don't know. I'm, I'm so confused. Well, if you, if, no, I'm saying if you have too many, then you have to you'll choose, right? What will you like to do, right? That's natural. Okay. But you, but you might, now that, that, that seems to be natural. Now, higher than that is what service needs to be done that's more important than can't wait. That will be a higher priority. Let me see what what needs to be done, or rather, as opposed to what I'd like to do. Mm -hmm. So then you can choose like that. If you can do all of it, then then that's ideal. But sometimes it's just not possible. So. Mm -hmm. What's the most important thing that needs to be done? Okay. So in one that of the, case, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can you, we can use examples, you know. Yeah, in that case, we we upset some devotees, you know, sometimes. Well, it depends. You have to explain that what you can do and what you can do. You know? I mean, I'm always getting requests, and a lot of the requests are contradictory in terms of the times. Mm. Just today, two more things appeared in my schedule for requests, and one of them happens to be in conflict with something else, and the other one could be in conflict with something else. Mm -hmm. So then I have to choose, you know. So you're going to disappoint one person, and you're going to make another person happy. For you, it's okay, Guru Maharaj. You never make anyone unhappy. You don't know everybody I know. <laughs> <laughs> Just like today, I got a text message from one person. He had five different things he wanted me to do. Five. Wow. All in the thing. And then he ended by saying, there's more, but I'll only give you five right now. <laughs> this happened. This happened today. I'm serious. <laughs> so I, I I I just answered the first two, and and I thought I'd say yes in the first two, and then maybe that would be enough. <laughs> <laughs> and then I didn't even answer the last three. So. <laughs> Okay. So yeah, it, it, this is life, you know. It's just the way it is. And how many can? You, how many should you do? Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Any questions from devotees? Any, um, anything on any topic? It doesn't have to re be related to this, but any questions? on any spiritual topics you can either jump right in or you can just raise your hand i'm going down the list so i don't miss anyone it's my helper is not here <laughs> if there isn't um maraj would you like to end with a round of chant uh, um, it's one round of chanting that's what i meant to say okay so we we ended okay good um yeah let me uh Take a few minutes here to. That's fine, my... Marge, no problem. Mm -hmm. At this. In relationship to Sukhavaha's question, I just remember 
something that Mother Teresa, the famous Mother Teresa said. You remember Mother Teresa? She was a great saint. Yep. Yeah. And someone asked her, Mother, how do you help so many people? And she said, one at a time. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Very good too. She puts her heart and soul into each one, each person she deals with, mm -hmm. one at a time. Not that she's just trying to rush through all of them and help so many. Each one is important, and each thing should be done with the, the utmost care and attention. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay.